Hello and welcome to episode two of The Han on Fire, brought to you by Firewise Learning Academy. I'm your host, Tim Davis. The Han on Fire is a YouTube channel and podcast featuring education, commentary, and conversation with world-renowned forensic scientist and author, Dr. John DeHaan, and his colleagues and friends. We hope you'll subscribe to this channel and ring the bell to get notifications so you'll be alerted to new additions to the channel right away. In today's discussion with Dr. DeHaan, we're looking at a very provocative and controversial question, which is, do cigarettes still cause fires? DeHaan on Fire contains discussion and video not suitable for all audiences. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to your channel, Dr. DeHaan. It's great to uh, be back with you. And uh, today we're going to tackle the first topic on this channel. And this is a really interesting one that uh, I was not aware of. And it's a really provocative question that is out there right now. And you've got uh, a lot of good evidence and some facts to give us. Do cigarettes still cause fires? What's the whole premise or what's the whole origin of this question being asked now? Well, proper fire investigation, whether it's a structure fire or um, accidental fire on a, on a dress, dressed person or um, a wildland fire, one of the challenges is the investigator has to create a list of potential ignition sources um, that, that need to be examined and excluded. And uh, with the intent, hopefully, of getting down to the point where, you know, there's one potential cause for this fire that I can't eliminate. And it, is a, uh, it does have the capacity to start a fire in this material. And so that's really a critical feature of modern, what they now call scientific fire investigation, is to create that list and test all of those possible uh, sources of ignition. And that's where we run into problems because everyone for decades has uh, included cigarettes, tobacco cigarettes, as, uh, as a potential igniter of fires, whether it's wildland fires or structure fires, bedding fires or clothing or whatever, because they're so, they were in such common use and they do represent a heat source and people you know, know that if they come in contact with the right kind of fuel, uh, yeah, they can ignite them. Well, so, you know, cigarettes was always considered one of your uh, possible uh, sources of ignition, and you needed as the investigator to examine that possibility. Um, and things have changed in the last few years. Um, the American government and most of the EU countries have uh, passed legislation mandating that what in America is sometimes referred to as fire safe cigarettes. And even that is uh, a misnomer. Uh, fire safe cigarettes would indicate to the consumer, oh, this means that these fire, these cigarettes can't start fires. Well, the FSC printed on the, on the package of cigarettes doesn't stand for fire safe cigarettes. That's how the vernacular is used. FSC actually stands for Federal Standard Compliant. So really, all that FSC means is that these cigarettes have been tested according to a reproducible laboratory-grade uh, ignition test and have met the standard for failure to ignite uh, the substrate in which they're on, in contact or as they're intended to, that they actually self-extinguish before they burn to completion. Now, that's an interesting you know, test because um, the issue is, well, you know, if, if, the, if the cigarette can start a fire before it burns its full length, why do we care whether it burns the full length or not? But this was an engineering uh, solution or was uh, an engineering solution was offered by the cigarette manufacturers. Hey, how about if we change the porosity of the paper of the cigarette and then we put ventilation holes in so that if the cigarette burns partway down, it kind of loses momentum uh, and, and you know, it's a very small fire, a glowing cigarette, sorry, a smoldering cigarette is a five watt fire, which is a very small quantity, a paper match 
by comparison, is a 50-watt fire. Mm. And so a 5-watt fire, well, I get the right fuel, the right exposure. Yeah, it can start an, a, a suitable, susceptible fuel uh, onto the road to ignition. And so that was, that was part of it. And so the test is, is actually, uh, it, it was created, you know, by extensive laboratory testing through NIST and, and, uh, and things like that to get a federal standard, uh, sorry, a, a standardized test. And it, it looks good from a scientific standpoint because the, your test target is uh, a stack of filter papers, laboratory filter papers. Well, that sounds good. Uh, paper is ignitable, but then you realize that those filter papers are pure cellulose. Cellulose itself is what 90 or 80 percent of paper and cardboard and things like that uh, is uh, consists of, but it isn't terribly ignitable. Um, pure cellulose doesn't really ignite very well or burn very well. So you think, well, okay, but this is reproducible, so we'll give it that. So the cigarette is lit placed on top of a stack of these, and then there's a, a shroud, uh, like a bell jar or something like that, placed around it to keep random uh, uh, air currents from affecting it, because a smoldering fire, especially a small one like this five-watt um, cigarette, is uh, very susceptible to the influence of a, a gust of wind or a breeze, changing the dynamics of the, of the combustion to the point where it's kind of a different animal. And um, so, okay, you put this on and then you time the duration of the burn. And as I said, it's supposed to self extinguish before it reaches a certain point. And then you're supposed to look at the, um, um, the burn, the, the, the stack of uh, filter papers and see if that has actually been ignited. Well, okay, I mean, the, oh, and then there's a, a fail standard uh, for a cigarette, uh, a cigarette type to be approved by this method. Uh, you can have up to 20% failures. In other words, they burn the full length or they actually scorch the cellulose uh, underlay and things like that. But that's a pretty wide margin, 20% failures, and you could still pass. So twenty, uh, so twenty percent of people who fall asleep under a bell container on top of a stack of <laughs> filter paper and drop their cigarette are still going to have a an issue. It, they still are running a risk. That's right. Yep. And so you go, well, okay, we've addressed the problem. Now, being the cynic that I am, I thought that's odd. Why would the the cigarette companies agree to this kind of test? standard, knowing that one of the things they count on is if you take a draft on a cigarette and put it down and forget it, it burns completely up. And if you want to continue to smoke, you're going to have to light another cigarette. So it, it's in their interest to have the cigarette continue to burn. Why would they agree to this? Well, then you realize this, the specifics of the test, like the cellulose target and, and uh, the, the absence of a full length burn and things like that. And you said, okay. Now, what is really interesting is that in Europe, the EU standards, they are not referred to as fire safe cigarettes. They are reduced ignition propensity cigarettes. So there's, there's an acronym for you. Technically, you know, that's a, that's a pretty fair description, reduced ignition propensity. But yes, then you realize what the acronym for that is, RIP. And needless to say, Cigarette companies don't want a big RIP symbol on each of their cigarette packs. So they tend to kind of soft, soft shoe that. I've done some limited scale testing as part of displays and, and lectures for fire investigators, in various uh, venues around the country and actually overseas. And, uh, you know, cigarettes can reliably start fires uh, a fair percentage of the time in ordinary combustibles, especially uh, tissue paper and Kleenex and paper towels. Interestingly enough, you know, cigarettes or discarded cigarettes are always the first thing wildland fires investigators look for. 
and justifiably so. I mean, they can start it, but if you actually go out and try to start a fire with a, a cigarette in under typical wildland fire conditions, it's a very much a long shot. I mean, you'd have to you'd have to put in about you know a hundred cigarettes before you actually got one to ignite the, the the dry grass, even under ideal conditions and stuff like that. But you do have to consider it because once in a hundred is, you know, still a possibility considering how many stupid people still throw their cigarette butts out the windows of passing cars and, and things like that. So, um, okay, but where does that leave us as fire investigators? Well, you know, a good fire investigators realize that, hey, cigarettes should not be eliminated from my list of suspects. Uh, but I've had I've had investigators argue, I don't even consider cigarettes anymore because they're all fire safe since, since what was it, five years ago, all the cigarettes sold in the U.S. are supposedly uh, FSC compliant. And uh, so I don't even consider it. I've had lawyers argue um, that, you know, we don't consider cigarettes a possible ignition source anymore because they're, they're guaranteed by our government to be you know, fire safe. You go, oh God, <laughs> there's a, there's a gap. So, um, you know, so we show the, we show the videos and stuff like that, but that's just me and some colleagues showing that, Hey, even these FSC cigarettes can start fires under the right conditions. And you need to consider that possibility. Well, um, uh, four or five years ago, I was in a, fire science, uh, fire engineering conference in San Francisco. And one of the speakers got the biggest amount of attention because she was from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, CPSC. And she introduces her topic. She says, I'm looking at ignition of, of bedding materials uh, by cigarettes. And you can hear this murmur through the audience going, well, why are you doing this? And she said, well, we can't, we're CPSC, we can't control cigarettes, but we can control the interaction of cigarettes with consumer products like um, cotton bed clothes and cotton mattress toppers and bed, you know, actual cotton, you know, bed linens. And she said, so we decided to test whether these cigarettes uh, are really safe or not. They did an incredibly thorough examination. They tested dozens of different types of cigarettes, um, both pre-FSC and current production ones. And then they picked um, uh, the number, uh, a number of the, the, the uh, cigarettes by brand uh, based on whether they were susceptible to or they, they they could start fires frequently or they couldn't so they they get, they covered that whole you know theoretical range they didn't just pick the worst ones they picked representatives from all three categories of risk and then they tested it under real world conditions of bed linens cotton mattress toppers and cotton blankets and and then tested with that same protocol against the fire safe cigarettes, the, the current production ones. <laughs> and they discovered in thousands of tests, there was no statistical difference between the two groups. So that FSC um, uh, uh, grade makes absolutely no difference in a real world fuel. Yes, they will pass this laboratory test, um, but that doesn't affect how much they are still a hazard to uh, the public. And uh, so we have to, you know, we have to treat these things as, as, a, as a potential cause. As fire investigators, we, we can't just arbitrarily eliminate um, modern, you know, current production cigarettes. Unfortunately, of course, this really riled the people like the National Fire Protection Association and some other consumer groups that were really pushing this. And NFPA made some pretty outrageous claims after this, this legislation was put into effect. And they were claiming that there was already a drop in fire deaths uh, as a result of cigarette ignition fires and things like that. And that was um, regrettable. 
and I've I've been in positions to challenge the NFPA statistics a number of times, and and uh, I'm no longer on their Christmas card list. Let's put it that way. Because now, if I remember correctly, a fire death was if the person died on the scene, but if they died later, was that kind oh, of a fire yeah, death? Oh yeah, that's the kind of statistical uh, stuff you you run into because because even gathering general statistics uh, on fire cause and fire deaths, you run into exactly that. If the, if, in some large city agencies, if the, if the person is found dead in the fire, they are considered, or after the fire in the building, they are considered a fire death. But if they're removed, either responsive or non-responsive or burned to, you know, uh, burned any, you know, to a serious extent that they're no longer alive, uh, that's a rescue. And so it's not a fire death. Mm. And some colleagues of mine have been really shocked when they, you know, they see these headlines from the fire department saying, you know, there's only been, you know, three fire deaths in our city uh, since, you know, the first of the year or something like that. And they go, well, wait a minute, you had five dead in one fire you know, three months ago. What happened to them? Well, they were just, you know, statistically <clears throat> invalidated. So, um, yeah, so even the process of deciding who's a fire death. Um, I'm, I'm currently looking at a, at a case where the two people living in this house were both committed smokers. They lived, they, they slept in separate bedrooms, and in the middle of the night, the, one of the individuals awoke, smelled smoke, saw smoke, saw flame coming through the wall uh, into uh, the spouse's bedroom, and he called 911 and reported it and said, you know, it's in her room, and there's flames coming through the wall, I'm going to go see and doesn't hang up the phone. He just puts it on the counter and the dispatcher can hear him walking away from the phone, presumably towards the seat of the fire, and can hear him coughing. Well, fire department gets there pretty quickly. It was a kind of a remote area. And the bedroom where she was was engulfed in a post flash over fire. Uh, she's eventually found very badly burned, actually burned through the floor of the bedroom. And um, he was found non-responsive at the other end of the house in, 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 with second degree burns and not a lot of fire damage. So now the issue is, well, who died first? Well, because uh, of some inheritance issue. And so I, I said, yeah, I'd look at it because there really isn't anybody else who understands the fire dynamics of a smoldering fire. Uh, and what happens to the smoke and the CO that it's generating. Smoldering fires, of course, have the highest, by a factor of 10 or 100, the highest output uh, of carbon monoxide because it's a smoldering fire, and uh, that's traditionally what produces the highest carbon monoxide levels of any kind of combustion. And so, you know, I looked at it and offered an opinion, and I'm now waiting to hear from the court as to, you know, what what my opinion is going to is going to matter to their uh, to their proceedings. So the cause in that case was a cigarette. Is just who perished first? Investigator that responded, uh, I think, did a, a first class job. Um, he knew about the history. Both of the individuals were committed smokers. Uh, the the the, uh, the uh, one spouse would go through three, you know, a couple of cartons a day on occasion. And, uh, but the other critical factor here is bed's completely burned. Uh, she's found out of the bed, but near, nearby and, uh, found in the remains under the bed is the oxygen generator that she used because she had, uh, uh chronic uh, lung problems. And so she would use a a, a mask and, and oxygen generator in the bed with her. Now that poses another high risk thing because if you take a smoldering cigarette um, and expose it to 100% oxygen, like coming out of a 
of, of an oxygen tank or even a lesser oxygen concentration out of an oxygen generator. You enhance the oxygen content being entrained in the cigarette to the point where it doesn't necessarily smolder anymore. It bursts into flame, which means it's a heck of a lot more likely to ignite bedding and clothing and things like that in the vicinity. And there have been a number of cases like that in observed in hospitals, for instance, uh, or care homes where the individual is smoking a cigarette and they refuse to give up the cigarette and they'll smoke for a while and then take a draft of, from the oxygen thing so they feel better. And eventually they get them mixed up <laughs> or come in contact with each other and the cigarette now becomes a little flame in their hands and gets dropped into the bedding or the clothing with fatal results. So the takeaway is fire, uh, cigarettes still cause fires and uh, investigators, lawyers, manufacturers, and people who God forbid might think, oh, cigarettes don't cause fires, now I can watch TV and fall asleep while I enjoy a cigarette in bed. They still cause fires and uh, don't do it. That's exactly right, yep. And you, you, know, you have to listen to the, the people who've actually done the real world testing with cigarettes and uh, low other similar low energy uh, ignition sources to see to, to to see the results. It actually they can actually start fires despite the label on the on the carton or on the pack. And that's an important reminder that part of the role of investigating a fire and determining causes isn't just to solve the mystery or uh, who's at fault, but it's also to protect life and prevent future things from happening. And it's a scientific method that's going to find that more than coming at things with a bias or because you've heard something or you have an investment somewhere. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, the whole, the, the whole reason we investigate fires is to prevent further deaths or injuries or property damage uh, from that cause in the future. And that's why we know, you know, high risk e events or actions that if we stop doing that or stop using that product or whatever, then we can, we can reduce the, the loss of life or the injury rate. Well, thanks for uh, that information, for sharing it with us and uh, for the work that you're doing to get that out. And of course, others that are looking at the same thing. I look forward to uh, getting together in the next episode. Who knows what the topic will be? <laughs> well, my pleasure. I uh, appreciate the, the exposure for this uh, issue. Thanks for tuning in to Dahan on Fire. If you have any questions for Dr. Dahan or comments about this channel, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Ring the bell for notifications of new uploads and don't forget to set your devices to receive those updates. Until next time, I'm Tim Davis for Dahan on Fire, brought to you by Firewise Learning Academy.